Very good evening to everyone and welcome to the second of our two talks dealing with current events. To the general theme, in the last day, perilous times shall come. And uh, last week, our uh, brother Grant uh, explained very profusely the impact of Russia's moves throughout the world, particularly the war in Ukraine. And we'd be aware of those impacts, given, given supply chain constraints, inflation and rising interest rates. So uh, tonight, Brother Grant will address us to the topics, the event in Israel and Iran shows the writing is on the wall. So I'm sure we look forward to that. We're also pleased to say that we've resolved the technical glitches that plagued us last week. And for the eagle eye among you will have realised that the hymns on the first slide behind me do not match what's on the board. We're going to operate on chairman's prerogative and run with what's on the board. So our first hymn will be hymn 281, after which please remain standing for prayer. O oh, our God, our Father who dwells in heaven, we are indeed privileged that in this land of peace and quiet, that we are able to come together freely, without hindrance, to ponder the message of your word and to consider the signs of the times, which so abound, so abound that we could be in danger of ignoring them altogether. So we thank you for this opportunity to come together and we ask for your blessing upon our brother Grant as he ministers your word to us and talks to us tonight about Israel and Iran and the challenges and the tensions between those two countries. We recognise, Heavenly Father, that there are others who cannot be with us tonight. And we pray for those who are sick, for those who struggle with the challenges of life, for those who, whose faith has grown dim. And we pray that in these very last days that you will strengthen and brighten, strengthen our faith and brighten our hope. So we leave this meeting in your care now and thank you for all your care for us in all things, in and through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our brother Grant has asked that we read together Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, as a background to his comments tonight. And we ask, please, our brother Philip Wigsell to come forward and read for us Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. Good evening all, reading with you from Matthew chapter 25 verses 1 to 13. <clears throat> then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil with their, in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. 
And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, and saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Thank you for that reading, Brother Philip. And so we now look forward to the um, information that our Brother Grant was prepared for us. Again, the overall theme, in the last days, perilous times shall come. And tonight's address, the events in Israel and Iran show the writing is on the wall. Thanks, Brother Grant. Well, my dear brethren and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, it really is a pleasure to come together and to be with you all again. It really is. Well, we're living in very dramatic times. There's no shadow of doubt about that as we look at the world scene. But first of all, what should we be doing? First and foremost, watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. But then, having said these, the calling on them to watch, Jesus encouraged them and us to do what he called on the faithful to do in Matthew chapter 25. And what was that? Well, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. We pray we are the faithful ones. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamp, and at midnight the cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. The bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Let us wisely accumulate oil. Secondly, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 onwards, he says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man who called his own servants and gave each talents according to his several abilities. So that he that had received five talents and brought other five talents, he used them in other words. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So the point is, faithfully use our qualities, my dear brethren and sisters, in our walk in Christ. And lastly, verse 40, the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So show love to others. There's what we must be doing, brethren and sisters, in this dark and degenerate age in which we live. We must be preparing. But remember it's provoked through watching. Well, Christ's return is absolutely sure and certain as day and night. Jeremiah 33 says, Thus saith Yahweh, if you can break my covenant, that there should not be day or night, then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign on his throne. It's sure and certain as day and night that he will. And how do we know that? Well, the Jews are back in the land. They're back in that land. And Isaiah 43 says, These Jews are my witnesses, saith Yahweh, that ye may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God form, clear evidence, the Jewish people. So the Jews have returned to the land of Israel. We know they had to do that from Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 36, look at 36 for a moment, bring you into your own land. The Jews will return, and they have done so. They've come back to that land, as the Lord in the Olivet Prophecy predicted, and they're there. 
But look at that quote we just referred to for a moment, Ezekiel 37. He makes six key points. He'll take them from among the Gentiles, among the heathen, and gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land. Now, we'll return to this quote in a moment, a little later. So they've returned. There's the state of Israel come into existence. We've seen it. We've seen it. It's there. 1948. And what are we seeing now? Oh, here we are. This last year. May last year. By then even, there has been a huge number of Jews that have come back to the land of Israel. Buoyed by Aaliyah, Israel population up to 9.5 million ahead of the 74th Independence Day. 73% of the, the people in the land are Jews. And so there has been significant return of the Jews to that land. Significant return. But my dear brethren and sisters, they're facing a major influx of Jews now from Russia, from Ukraine. From Ukraine, look at the date, halfway through last year, they had, by then even, 8,371 Ukrainian Jews coming back to the land. And from Russia, they reckon up to 40,000 have gone. 40,000, think of it. They reckon it's a real big brain drain from Russia, and I'm sure it is, being Jewish. You know, they are very clever people. But think of this quote, brethren and sisters. I will say to the north, that's Russia area, give up, Ukraine, give up, and bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And of course, that will be even more fulfilled in the future in the days of Elijah. But it's happening right now. They're returning in huge numbers back into the land of Israel. Isn't it fascinating? So the problem is, where are you going to put them? I want to ask you a question. What's the size of Israel compared to Tasmania? Is it bigger? Is Israel bigger or smaller than Tasmania? Hands up those who think it's bigger. Well, you're right. It can fit into Tasmania 3.3 times. It's tiny. It's tiny. And in Israel, the population density is that. Compare it with Australia. Oh, staggering. Where are they going to put them all? This is the problem. They're coming back. Israel sets the goal on doubling the number of Jewish settlers on the Golan Heights. Yes, they want to take control of those Golan Heights and make sure it stays Jewish. But who would live there <laughs> behind this? And the vulnerability of Syria, but they are coming. And they are living there. Because they've got to go somewhere in Israel. And Israel's running out of farmland. Look, here's the West Bank. Israel set up to approve 4,000 settler units in occupied West Bank. Look at the date. Between 600,000 to 750,000 Israeli settlers live there now. And it's growing. Reason? Well, Israel doesn't want them to live on farmland. Doesn't want Tel Aviv to expand too much. Let it go this way, but not that way, please. And they're saying that price of land in the West Bank is one third of what it is in the main part of Israel. So where are they going? Heading for the West Bank. Heading for the West Bank. And look at the climbing population in the West Bank. That's over two years. So Israel is moving. But as well as that, my dear brethren and sisters, Israel is prospering. It is prospering. Ezekiel 38 said that in verse 8 and verse 11, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages to them that dwell safely, confidently, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. So there they're dwelling confidently, confident in self, not in God as they should be. But what about their prosperity? Look at this verse. Ezekiel 38 says that when Russia comes down, it comes down to take a spoil, a plunder, a spoil, a plunder, a spoil. Oh, Israel's got something. 
It's got something. It's got wealth. Just in the last little while, they say the last, with Netanyahu coming into power and such like, Israel's bonker politics, its economy, however, is thriving. Look at the pictures they're showing of what's going on. The money currency is climbing. Israel, the Middle East nation of 9 million, is an economic juggernaut. It has the fastest growth and one of the lowest rates of inflation and joblessness. Oh, Australia could take a leaf out of their book, that's for sure. And on top of that, the shekel is one of the best performing currencies in about 31 that trade with Israel. So we can see what's going on. Even since Netanyahu had come into power, because that's worried the economists, it still climbed 4% against the US dollar. So here's the exports from Israel. It's climbing. It's climbing. A little wonder. After Trump came into power, of course he set up the Abraham Alliance, and here's the consequence of it. Here's the nations that tried it with him, with Israel. After that alliance, and in the first year, look, it goes to 2021, it went up by three times the trade with the Arab world. With the Arab world. But we're not in 2021, we're 2022. Now, 2023, but 2022, I haven't got the figures individually, but the total was that. Wow, nine times. The economy is growing dramatically in Israel. Dramatically. And there's other things that are helping Israel. They found a new oil field. There's the old one, the Leviathan one. You see there, that's a big field it was. Look what they found. Look at the date, last year. Okay, it's not, well, the, uh, uh, the fine company that found it says it's not as big as the Leviathan field by any means, but yeah, they often say that early in the piece. It certainly covers a bigger area. And so, indeed, Israel is really looking like it's going to prosper. A real temptation to Russia to come south. But as well as that, they found oil. Here's Lebanon. And there's they're worrying about the boundary between Lebanon and Israel. But it's finally agreed that this line 23 would be the boundary. So most of this new oil field, this other oil field, not the one I showed you a moment ago, but another one is in Lebanon. And Israel said to Lebanon, you can have it. Just give to us a little bit of the yield. They said, okay. And you know, that's intriguing because that's the way Brother Thomas thought it would happen. I'll read you what Brother Thomas said in Exposition of Daniel. The power that comes into possession of Tyre and Zidon, that's Lebanon, and all the coasts of Palestine, with Edom, Moab, Ammon, Egypt, Ethiopia and Seba, is the great latter-day antagonist to go. So he says the people who run Lebanon will be somewhat more pro-Israel. There are terrorists there, I know. But the people who run it will be more friendly with Israel. Now, I told you Israel will be dwelling confidently. They're at the moment supplying missiles to Ukraine. They're Iron Dome missiles. They cost, you know, tens of thousands each missile that fires up. But Israel's just developed a new missile device. Look what it is. It's a laser. Amazing defence system. World's most powerful laser weapon ever. <laughs> I, don't, I find it hard to believe what they're saying here. One trillionth of, of a watt in one quadrillionth of a second. So this is what they think is going to happen. Boom. They can ping off missiles like that with lasers. And during the Gaza war, they had one of these tank-like things, which are generators with a laser on it, along the border, several of them on the border with Lebanon. And the terrorists in Lebanon fired missiles, four of them into Israel, and each blew up in Lebanon before it crossed the border. Lasers blew it out. Crash. One crashed into the sea, the other three crashed into Lebanon. So they fired no more. So Israel is growing in confidence. Nobody's got a weapon like that. Nobody. And as well as that, just recently they're very worried about Iran. More on that in a minute. They called up a lot of their young people. And quite a few of the girls were showing 
on the screen coming forward. Tens of thousands of them. And then they showed them going into rooms. And behind, in the rooms, they were running computers. And what were they controlling? These. They were controlling tanks that they could drive into Gaza or Lebanon or wherever you wanted. And the girls with their computers were in control of it. Incredible. No loss of life there. But they could use those tanks against the enemy. They have been equipped by America. These F-35 planes. Um, they are very capable. They apparently can, are not easily picked up on the radar. And they have been supplied by America. And Israel has gutted them and refilled them with those, the technology they want. And they're using this to warn Iran. Look out. And so, indeed, Israel's arm exports are skyrocketing. They are skyrocketing amid Ukraine war, Iran and Abraham Accords. So, indeed, look at their export figures. Ha! Staggering announcement for a little tiny country. But now let's come over to Israel and its alliance with the Tarshan-like countries. What do we expect from Scripture? We know, don't we? Sheba and Dedan, Yemen, Oman. With the merchants of Tarshish, which we believe is Britain, art thou come to take a spoil, is said to Russia. So with them is the Tarshan block nations. Edom and Moab and Ammon is Jordan as well. So the Abraham alliance, the Tarshan countries and Jordan will be pro-Israel. So here's that Abraham Accord. And there are the nations that Trump suggested that were joined together. It's interesting, it's Oman at the moment, uh, sorry, Sudan at the moment, has, uh, looks like it's agreeing to normalise with Israel. But at the same time, it's allied to Russia. More on that in a minute. So, what's going on right now? Well... Now, going back two years, the Prime Minister then, Mr Bennett on the right there, met secretly last week with Jordan's King Abdullah in Amman. Look at the relationship. They were enemies. They were fighting before. Not anymore. And again, Israel's president making his first visit to the United Arab Emirates. Again, friendly with the Arab countries. And Naftali Bennett visit Bahrain. Staggering. All of these Arab countries, they feel safe to go and visit these countries, and they are coming together as the scriptures predicted. And here, here's the, one of the previous kings, uh, prime minister, there he is, and he's met King Abdullah of Jordan. There we are, Israel, to accelerate implication, impl implementation of an Israeli Jordan industrial park. In other words, they would be having industry on both sides of the River Jordan and trading. And they apparently got a bridge up here. I don't know why they call it the Allenby Bridge. I thought it was further south. But that's what they said in the article. This bridge is now open to lanes of traffic going 24 hours of the day in trade between Israel and Jordan open to frequent trade between the two. Staggering. A joint industrial zone between Israel and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Look at their alliance. Exactly as we have seen from Scripture. And as Brother Thomas wrote, amazing, isn't it? And the Arab countries that we talked about before, those Abraham Accord nations or alliance of nations, along with many of the Tarshan countries, came together, look, Saudi, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Egypt, and so forth, in a massive military manoeuvre early last year. The largest naval military manoeuvre in the Middle East up until that point. Staggering. In alliance with Israel. In alliance with Israel. And so it's not surprising that even Saudi hopes to normalise ties with Israel. The Saudi foreign minister has acknowledged the kingdom's keen interest 
in establishing ties with the Jewish state. This is exactly as we would have expected from Scripture. But 10 years ago, we'd never anticipated quite like this. And yet it's coming to pass. And what about Britain? Well, I've got a new Prime Minister. There he is. He's an partially Indian. And uh, yes, he was brought up in Britain. Very rich man. And what does he say? Look at the words. Front page of a magazine. Jerusalem is, the indisputed, is indisputedly the historic capital of Israel. I agree with it, he says. I agree with it. That Jerusalem is the capital. And he is saying that he will visit Israel shortly. No doubt that will help Britain in its economy tie up with a little bit with Israel and its incredible capacity. Now, brethren and sisters, if I'm going too fast, tell me to slow it down. Go like that. Or if it's too loud, call me, say quiet. We indicate so. Anyhow, what about the new king? <laughs> there he is. King Charles III. He's not yet been crowned. A friend of UK jury with specific and historic ties to Israel. Here he is. He's made this rabbi a knight. And here he is in Israel. A little earlier when one of the kings, one of the people over there died, he went over to a funeral. So he is indeed, it seems, quite pro-Israel. But he's not the only one that's pro-Israel. The prime minister and now the king. So it's amazing. Well, US military shifts the army bases from Qatar to Jordan. Now, isn't that where we expect Edom, Ammon and Moab to be? And we expect the Edom, Ammon and Moab, Jordan, to be strong because it will have Britain and probably America allied to it? Well, two years ago, look what happened. They shifted the base from the area there at Qatar to Jordan. It was the biggest military US base in the Middle East. Moved there and fulfilling that quote. Edom, Ammon and Moab, chief of the children of Ammon. There are the Tarshan power in that area. Staggering, isn't it? Absolutely staggering. But now, Israel's in conflict due to the West Bank. Now we know, don't we, that I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel 37. 38. Gather out of many people against the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 39. Ye shall fall upon the mountains of Israel. The mountains of Israel are significant. What are they? Well, here's that quote I, I looked at before, Ezekiel 37. And it shows six steps to the kingdom coming. Israel's back in the land. But it must become one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And then what happens? One king shall be king to them all. Who's that? Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it... Oops. I've lost my screen. Oh no, there it is. I don't know what happened there. All right. So, now the election's taken place with Netanyahu. Going fine. Yep. If I win the elections, he says, I will annex the West Bank. Where's the mountain part of Israel? It's on the West Bank. That's the only real mountainous area, isn't it? Netanyahu concedes that annexation will probably not happen during Joe Biden's term. But not at the moment. He's now becoming much more aggressive in that regard. That's what he said as he was going to the elections. But now... Israel swears in a new right-wing parliament. Netanyahu just got a majority, but to make sure he got his majority, he allied with a very right-wing religious party. A very right-wing religious party. And now he has 65 seats in a 120-seat parliament. So he's got the majority. And it's a huge right-wing alliance that he's got. And what do they want? They want him to fulfil what he said. Take control of the West Bank. That's ours. Netanyahu appoints one of the men from that ultra-right-wing block, the religious block, and the article calls him the Prime Minister of the West Bank. Well, he's not, of course. He's going to be a 
the operator there looking after it. But I think that article is a little joking in that sense. An extraordinary coalition deal gives the righteous religious Zionist leader full responsibility in the biblical Judea and Samaria, which Netanyahu wishes to annex. And so the situation is moving quite rapidly and desperately. We looked at this before. Israel is set to move, approve 4,000 settlers into the West Bank. Between 600 to 750,000 Israelis live in at least 250 settlements already in the West Bank. And they're talking about another 4,000 settlements. Staggering. They're going to take it over. There's no shadow of a doubt about it. And the numbers will increase. But now, how's the rest of the world viewing that? Well, King Hussein say, warns Israel of a massive conflict. OK, it's a few years ago. If they take control of the West Bank, look out, he says. The US warned against the unilateral Israeli steps in the West Bank. They say it's apartheid. Look at the date. And the UN votes 98 to 17 against what Israel's doing. The occupation will need to end, they say. And lastly, oh, lastly, <laughs> the Pope himself summons US and Israeli envoy and warns them against this uh, annexation. He says it'll be a great global outcry if you take that. And so things are looking quite tricky. But as well as that, coming slightly aside, there's a lot of opposition to Netanyahu. Oh, yes, he has over a majority of it. But look, over 100,000 are protest for five straight weeks in the streets of Israel. What are they saying? Netanyahu has been too right-wing, dictatorial. He's taking absolute control of what he's doing. And they are saying to him, just calm it down, take it slower. Don't do that. But things are changing dramatically in the Middle East at the moment. Well, what about Israel? Minor tremors. Oh, no. There we are. <laughs> Minor tremors reported in Jerusalem after the devastating earthquake in Tyre, Turkey and Syria. In Israel, they reported a 4.4 earthquake in the Dead Sea area. So in other words, that earthquake, that massive earthquake we've heard of two days ago, it's had a tremoring, had an impact all the way down the fault lines, right down into the Dead Sea. And what is that telling us? This area is active. This is area is dangerous. And look what the experts say. They've warned Israel that the infrastructure is not adequately prepared for a major earthquake. We know what's going to happen, don't we? That place is going to change. The Mount of Olives will be split. The Mount Zion will be elevated. The Dead Sea will come up again and the water will flow the other way into the Sea of Galilee and out into the Mediterranean. It will be a dramatic effect. And as scriptures say, it will be a day when the towers fall worldwide. It will be a massive earthquake in the Middle East. But are we seeing a forerunner to that now? I think we're being shown something. And so are we are being stirred. But now come across to Iran. Got to keep a close eye on my time to make sure I don't overrun with you. Iran and her militant proxies, the Hezbollah, the Hamas, threaten Israel. We expect that, don't we? That Persia or Iran, with all its bans, will be allied with Russia and therefore opposing to Israel. Therefore oppose Israel. Well, if we go to the Middle East today, the nations around Israel are being armed by Iran with missiles and equipment. So the terrorists up in Lebanon, the Hezbollah, have over 150,000, some say twice that number, of missiles facing Israel. Hamas, at least 13,000. I couldn't get the numbers for the Fatah and the Palestinian area. But over a 1,000 in Iran, of course, uh, day by day, Israel's hitting them. More on that in a minute. But the terrorists around there claim they are capable of firing 4,000 missiles a day against Israel. That laser may work quite well. Let's hope. 
Uh, but that's what they're claiming. They are there to destroy Israel. Tyran's strategy is to surround the Jewish state with as many fire bases as it can from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Gaza and the West Bank to attack it. And the prospect of a major war is imminent. The Hezbollah is on, the air, on high alert as the great northern wall approaches, say they, last year. Only a few months ago. The Hezbollah is actively preparing for a direct armed conflict with Israel. They've got 20 to 30,000 reservists who've been put on alert. They're ready at the moment. It sounds very imminent. War is fast approaching. And Israel at the same time knows that these terrorists are there in Lebanon, but here in Syria, they day by day almost, no, it's week by week, they attack. Here Israel strikes Damascus three times that week. The planes come over. They do not get hit by missiles, but missiles come into Lebanon. Occasionally those missiles get hit by devices in Lebanon. But mostly, 90% of Iran's weaponry going into, Leb uh, into Syria, I should have said, is being destroyed. And it's particularly going into places like Damascus. Have a look at Damascus in some parts now. That's the consequence of Israel's attacking those areas where the Iranians have been putting weapons. We know that's what's going to happen. Isaiah 17 says Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins. Is that not what we're seeing? Sure is. And at the moment... Everybody is very concerned in Israel as well as Lebanon, but where subject tonight is Israel. Look at the date this year, 2023, January 26. Whew, that's only a few days ago or weeks ago. The largest US Israeli exercise in history concluded. And what's the aim? To let Iran know that. They together will defend Israel or attack Iran to thwart the effort to obtain nuclear weapons in Iran. So 140 American planes came over, 6,400 troops and so on. And Israel called up many of its troops, as I said to you before. What are they saying? They're getting ready to move. And that's what we're looking at now. Persia, modern Iran, arms and allies with Russia. We know it will happen. Ezekiel 38 says, Rosh will ally, verse 5, with Persia, modern Iran. Staggering, isn't it? We knew this. Now, go back a few years ago. Already at that time, Iran had bases to make nuclear weapons, no less than 10 most of them underground. There's a few on the top of the ground where they were based. Nuclear weapon base where they can manufacture uranium or plutonium. And now, go back to January, that's about a year ago, this man came to power in Iran. And what did he do? He made a two-day visit overseas. Well, not quite overseas. But he went up and saw Putin. There he is with Putin. The new leader made a two-day visit to Russia for the coalition between Iran, Russia and China, maybe, will occur, said the Tehran Times. So the real concern is the threat from Iran is growing to levels not seen and it will intensify, says the Israelis. The IDF, the Israeli Defence Force chief, said I, the IDF must prepare to strike a blow against Iran and stop them. Got to act swiftly. A possible attack on the facilities is looking necessary. Look, last year and the year before, America, Europe negotiated, negotiated, negotiated with Iran at least eight times. 
Each negotiation would have lasted weeks. They got nowhere. They got nowhere. And now the situation is now urgent. Iranian nuclear talks, now urgent, but they don't want to talk. They've had enough. And so the situation is <clears throat> that a new Iranian deal with Iran, too late. It will not prevent an Iranian bomb. The enrichment is now past weapons grade, up to 90%. And they reckon Iran will have a nuclear bomb in three weeks. But look at the date. That's past now. That would be four months ago. And so the situation is looking very scary indeed. Now, what's Iran's aim? They have the missiles that's needed. That one, there's an ICBM. It goes intercontinental ballistic missile. It goes into orbit. can hit any country in the world. It goes out into orbit, circles the Earth, and then comes in when they want it. But they have also missiles that do that. And they're aiming to attack Israel. They're aiming to attack Israel. But look at this headline. Jerusalem Post. Iran says it will build nuclear warheads and turn New York also into a hellish ruins. And there, that was July last year. They were on the brink of a nuclear breakout then. It's past that date, they say. The evidence looks insurmountable. But in order to hit the targets they want, excuse me, let me just go back. Israel, uh, sorry, Russia launched an Iranian, a missile for Iran, not a missile, a satellite that went over Israel so they could photograph everything they needed. They could develop where they have to hit, the targets they need and so on. Here's Russia working with Iran. And of course, as we know, Iran has helped Russia up in the Ukraine. We talked about that last class. They provided these sort of missiles these were sent, cruise missiles, from Iran to Russia. Now Russia is sending planes, aircraft, bombers and fighters down to Iran in quite significant numbers at the moment. So, as, so the US warns Russia in giving Iran unprecedented military and technical support, which they're doing. But now, let's look at Russia for a moment. Russia is still on the borders of Israel. Look at the date. Moscow have troops on the ground in Syria. Yes, as well as America. But American one numbers are diminishing. And the Russian ones are somewhat a little. But they are there on the borders of Israel. Not only that. Whoops. Um, Russia, Syrian pilots, almost day by day, fire... fire fly bombers and fighters along the border of Israel. And so here is Israel, here is Russia, right on the borders of Israel. You know, many, many years ago, I would never have expected that. I thought Christ would be back before then. Boy, are we showing signs. And now, Putin warns of a Middle East war. Vladimir Putin is set to lead Russia politically for the rest of his life. Now, this is a dated article. Notice the date. And is warning at the same time of a catastrophic Middle Eastern war in the near future. I don't believe he's changed his mind. So the days are short. Israel, it's got to attack Iran. And may provoke the Russian attack. And so what we're expecting to see... The threat from Iran is growing to levels not seen before. And so what's Israel going to do? It's going to attack. How is that attack to be executed? We don't exactly know. But Israel, about a week ago, sent in drones, several drones, and blew up a site in Iran. I don't know how they got there, but they did. But it was possibly this way. During some years ago, the war between... Azerbaijan and Armenia. Armenia got armed by Russia and Azerbaijan got armed by Israel. Israel. And so Azerbaijan has given Israel several airports on the borders of Iran. So you see, 
if Israel wants to fly into Iran, that's what they're going to do. They can go across there, refuel their planes, and then fly from Azerbaijan into there. Now, I don't say dogmatically that's what's going to happen, but it's capable of doing so. And so the situation is looking very scary. Israel holds an air drill simulating a strike on nuclear program. Look, it's Israel and USA doing that. And it was only a month or so ago when that took place. All right? So what's the answer? Well, Israel has only months to destroy Iran's facilities, says the minister. And so things are looking scary, to say the least. Well, Russia will invade Egypt to take control of Egypt's wealth. We know that from the Bible. Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, speak of our day, didn't they? But in verse 42, he says, The king of the north, Russia, shall stretch out his hand against the land of Egypt, and it shall not escape. And he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver. Wealth. Out of Egypt. Yes. We'll see in a second. And over all the precious things of Egypt. Well, only a year or so ago, the largest natural gas field in the Mediterranean was found by Egypt. The unfortunate thing was it was 190 kilometres off the coast and they didn't have the money to develop it. But now, they have developed it. It was twice the size of the Israeli field and it came on shore last year. And the result was Israel was able, to, uh, uh, Egypt was able to export gas, LPG, oil to Europe and made $45 billion. You think of it, staggering field, staggering amount. The highest in Egyptians history. They normally run a deficit, but now it's a pros they're positive. Look at the exports they've got because of it. And so, Egypt seeks to boost the gas exports to Europe as Russia-Ukraine war drags on. Egypt hopes to boost its natural gas exports at a time when the European countries are gradually giving up alliance on the Russian hydrocarbons. They're depending upon places like Egypt, even Australia, to run the country, to run Europe. And so huge amounts of oil are coming from there. There is a pipeline from Israel down to Egypt. And there Egypt is compressing the gas, the LPG, and putting it on ships also from Israel going into Europe. Staggering the events that we're seeing transpire. But now, brethren and sisters, the days are quickly flying. The time of Christ's return is almost here. And... Christ's return will come. He shall enter into the land, into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. And so when he comes into there, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the Ammon will oppose, oppose it. So the great prophecies of the scriptures are becoming a reality between, before our eyes, before your eyes, my dear brethren and sisters. The time is super, super short. So be prepared. Remember what the scripture said that we started with? Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 said, And there shall come, this is as that chapter ended, and then shall the king, that's after they have accumulated their oil, applied their talents, that's us, and love one another. And then it says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There is the call to us, my dear brethren and sisters. The time is super short. Prepare. The days are short. The kingdom is almost here. And so let us prepare. Well, my dear brethren and sisters, the days are indeed short. 
I'll put this one up just to fill up for a second. We've got about three or four minutes. You might find it interesting. The Testimony magazine came out with this a number of years ago on the basis of the time periods in Daniel 11, uh, Daniel 12. And it speaks of three time periods. That time, times that are dividing times, and that 1335. And it says, blessed is he who comes to the 1335. If we go from the time of Daniel, when they said the sacrifice is finished, and at 1260 you come to 8688 when they began the Muslim, Dome of the Rock was built over the Holy Soul. And Daniel speaks of the abomination of desolation there. All right? Now, if we add 1260 to that date, we get this 1948. The state of Israel is born. But if we add one, 1335, and I cannot guarantee this, my dear brethren and sisters, I just thought it was fascinating. This is where it terminates. Notice I put a question mark there. But the scripture says, Blessed is he that cometh to the 1335. Is it this year? Or is it a few years from now? But we know the days are very short. Here's another way of looking at things. Moses, in our readings only a few days ago, was up on the mountain for 40 days. 40 years goes from AD 70, uh, 8030, when Christ began his ministry, to 8070, and the fall of Jerusalem. Now, if we get 40 jubilees and go from when Christ began, completed his ministry, 40 jubilees is 40 fifties, 2,000. Add that to that, you've got 2033. Could this be 10 years ahead when Armageddon takes place? If so, take 10 years off and it could be this year when the Lord might return. All right, well, we'll leave it there, my dear brethren and sisters, but we long for this day, don't we? It's only just around the corner. So be actively in prayer, actively accumulating the oil, Actively using your talents, my dear brethren and sisters. Actively caring one for another. So that ultimately, my dear brethren and sisters, we will be there together in that wonderful day. Thank you. We do thank Brother Grant for his presentation tonight as he discusses the tensions between Israel and Iran. And it's worthwhile remembering how we started tonight, the reading from Matthew 25, and the reminder that we're to watch because we do not know the day or the hour of our Lord's return. But are there signs in abundance? There, they certainly are. So we thank you, Brother Grant, for the two sessions you've provided for us on the signs of the times. Now, next week's Bible... <clears throat> At the close of our evening together, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the quiet time wherewith you have blessed us. We've been reminded that the bridegroom can come at any hour. We need to be well prepared need to be vigilant, watching and praying. We thank you that in these last days you have blessed us with an abundance of signs. Signs which, from the ordinary person's point of view, would lead their hearts to fail for fear. But it's at this time that our Lord reminds us, when you see these things, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh, and we pray for that day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you provide abundantly for us, and for the supper that, we're, that we will have shortly, we thank you, we thank you for your abundance, and indeed, we are kept in your hand and sustained day by day. So we thank you for all things through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. 
Amen.